or cat? Bar. Scripture. Scripture! Man! I'll get it eventually. Is that, maybe I'm getting cold. Nothing's moving. Isaiah 9. You know what I was, the problem I was thinking about, I can't think about two things. You know, I have my Bible open up here, and I read this. Our Sabbath school lesson today was, God chose a man of integrity, or uh, Nehemiah chose a guy who had integrity and respected God. I just was, I was just saying that I walked up here to explain this uh, story, and it wouldn't be nice if, if we were known for our integrity and our and our relationship with God. Wouldn't this be a great, great church? Okay, so Isaiah. Isaiah 9. Now, 2 plus 4 or is it 2 through 4? 2 through 4? Okay. 9. Isaiah 9, 2 through 4. The people who once walked in darkness will see great light. Those who lived in the land of spiritual darkness will be flooded with the light of a new dawn. The Lord will enlarge our nation and bring us great joy. The people will rejoice before you as a people do at the end of a large harvest, as men of war do when they divide the spoil. The Lord, you have taken the yoke from their shoulders and broken the rod that beats them. You defeated the nations and took them captive just as you defeated the forces of Midian so long ago. And now we have our pastor Tom to go bring us our message this morning. All right. Our mission at this church is to sincerely and freely share the grace, healing, and power of the gospel so that everyone knows Jesus Christ when he returns. We went through that together, and I'm going to try to remember to put it right here when it comes to the sermon time when I'm here so that we can keep reminding ourselves of it. Knowing Jesus hopefully leads to saying yes to him. That's the title today, saying yes to God. And uh, let's pray as we get started here. Heavenly Father, thank you again for your word. Um, I don't want to be in the way, so I pray that you would speak and uh, may each of us get what we need uh, in order to, to make that choice to say yes. And we pray this in your name. Amen. <clears throat> a man sat with his back to a, a tree there in the shade. He was in tears from an ongoing crisis in his life. It had fallen apart. He had spent himself in addictive behavior and had a deep sense of failure and loss. He had experimented with various religions. He was interested in those kinds of things. He had rejected the Christian faith of his mother, but had come to wonder whether it might be true after all. With the depth of his own sin, for he knew all these things were sins, it was too much for him. There under the tree, deep and gloomy, heard a voice of a little child repeating over and over again something that sounded like it was from a nursery rhyme, but he couldn't place it. Take up and read. Take up and read. Take up and read. And he had no idea what it could possibly mean, except he decided to go back inside the house and pick a book off the shelf and take it up and read it. And his eyes fell on these words. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. This man was later known as Saint Augustine or Augustine. He said yes to God, finally. His mother's prayers were answered after a long, long time. The voice in the garden told him to take up and read. His writings uh, had a profound influence on the church. May, you might even say it, it was something God used to save Christianity. You know, he was a huge influence on a guy named Martin Luther. You ever heard of him? And because of Martin Luther, the church went back to the Scriptures to figure out what we should believe. Augustine, or 
one of my English teachers say, the right way is Augustine, was a part of that. Saying yes to God makes all the difference. So we've got the New Testament. It's a commentary on the Old Testament. And I promise you this is a seasonal sermon, um, but we have to tie some things together with the two halves of the Bible. In the New Testament you find quoted passages from the Old, and when you go back and look at those verses in the original context, it can be difficult to see how the New Testament writer uh, was able to get the new meaning from the old verse. Well, Jesus is the lens through which the New Testament writers saw their Hebrew scriptures, and uh, we'll see a little bit about that today. The question under consideration is, are you going to say yes to God? And the verse that is in common between the Old and New Testaments here today, um, the characters who received it reacted in opposite ways. Old Testament, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 7 today. Uh, at first, the air was thick with fear in the city of Jerusalem. There were armies marching against it. One was a foreign army, the military of Aram. But the other army was from the sister nation of Israel, their kinsmen, attacking or preparing to attack Jerusalem. And they could see the dust rising on the horizon. Why were Israel and Aram attacking the city? Well, they were trying to force the nation of Judah, to help them against another enemy. They wanted to depose the king and put their own man on the throne in order to use all of their resources against another threat, the threat of Assyria. So there they were, waiting for a siege. The dust on the horizon became an army at the base of Jerusalem's walls, and they were more or less ready. And a runner came to the palace with a message about Jerusalem's water supply. You have to have water if your city is surrounded. Otherwise, your people will die really quickly. How long can you go without water? Three maybe three days. Less, depending on your health, maybe. <coughs> King Ahaz and the members of his court made their way through the city to what we would call an aqueduct to check out the water supply. Isaiah chapter 7 and it's going to be a little distracting uh, because there's a lot of really weird names. That's okay. I guarantee you that I am mispronouncing them. And if you mispronounce them, that's okay. None of us are native speakers of the original, so it's all right. Ahaz was the son of Jotham, who was the son of Uzziah. When Ahaz was king of Judah, Rezin, king of Aram, and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to fight against it. But they were not able to defeat the city. Ahaz, king of Judah, received a message saying, The armies of Aram and Israel have joined together. When Ahaz heard this, he and the people were frightened. They shook with fear like trees of the forest blown by the wind. And then the Lord told Isaiah, dot, dot, dot. Okay, this is the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is the narrator. And, this, and God has been speaking to uh, the people of the nation uh, through Isaiah for about 20 years. His ministry had begun during the time of Ahaz's grandfather, Uzziah. Uzziah had been receptive, but more recent kings, not so much. Ahaz had nothing to say to a prophet of the Lord, but God told Isaiah to go talk to Ahaz. And so this is where Isaiah brings the message. He says, yes, to God. The Lord told Isaiah, you and your son Shear Jashub should go up and meet King Ahaz at the place where the water flows into the upper pool on the road where people do their laundry. Tell Ahaz, be careful, be calm and don't worry. Don't let those two men, Rezin and Pekah, son of Remaliah, scare you. Don't be afraid of their anger or Aram's anger because they are like two barely burning sticks that are ready to go out. They have made plans against you, saying, let's fight against Judah and tear it apart. We'll divide the land for ourselves and make the son of Tabeel, the new king of Judah. But I, the Lord God, say their plan will not succeed and it will not happen. So God is showing grace to this king. King Ahaz was one of the worst kings that Judah had ever had. He was not a good king. He had sacrificed his own son to idols and publicly rejected the true God in other ways as well. And yet God is reaching out to him here through the prophet Isaiah. You know, people do repent. There's characters in the scriptures that committed similar sins and came back to God. And God was hoping, I think, to get Ahaz back in the same way. 
Isaiah brought this message from the Lord. Ahaz and the city could trust God to take care of their enemies if they would choose to trust God. Would they say yes? I, the Lord God, say their plan will not succeed, it will not happen, because Aram is led by the city of Damascus. Damascus is led by its weak king, Risen. Within 65 years, Israel will no longer be a nation. Israel is led by the, nation of, by the city of Samaria. Samaria is led by the weak king, the son of Remaliah. If your faith is not strong, you will not have strength enough to last. I'm going to read that last part, because there's so many names. It's such a mouthful. If your faith is not strong, you will not have strength enough to last. The Lord comes to Ahaz and, and invites him to trust him. Will you trust me? The, the Lord says to the king here. Some of you guys have been followers of Jesus for a long time, and some of you may need to make that decision yourself. But if God can make this call to a, a man who had sacrificed his own son to an idol, there's nothing in your life to keep you from God. God invites you to follow Him. There is no sin that is too great to keep a person from turning towards the Lord and having a changed life and a different future. Trust me, God says. The only way to stand is to stand firm in me. And so Ahaz is given an opportunity by Isaiah. Isaiah gives him the chance to ask for a sign. Verse 10 says, The Lord spoke to Ahaz again, saying, Ask for a sign from the Lord your God to prove to yourself that these things are true. It may be a sign from as deep as the place of the dead or as high as the heavens. <coughs> what do you think about asking for signs? Something you do? Something you recommend? Or not so much? It probably depends on your reason for asking for a sign. If you're asking for God to prove His existence, uh, I would recommend against that. Okay, um, God does not wait; uh, does, is not looking to do that. You have to you have to believe that He exists and believe that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him, as the Scripture said. Okay, but if you're looking for direction in a way that you can obey, that's something that's a little bit more acceptable. <clears throat> So Isaiah is inviting Ahaz to ask for a sign, and if Ahaz asks for a sign in this particular case, it shows that he is trusting God to carry out what he says. 65 years is a long time. Did you hear that number go by and all those names? Okay, there was a timeline there. In 65 years, Israel would not be a nation anymore. Okay? That's longer than Ahaz is going to live, longer than Isaiah is going to live. Trust me, the Lord says, and I'll prove it to you in the meantime, because that's too long to wait. Does Ahaz ask for a sign? If you're reading, following along in Isaiah chapter 7, you see that he does not. He says, I will not ask for a sign or test the Lord. Now we might think, hey, that's nice and humble. But that's not the kind of man that Ahaz was. We know from the rest of his life in the, in the Bible. It's not a statement of faith. He was not a king that was loyal to God, and he was not loyal in the situation. There's two ways to interpret it. One is that he's pretending to be humble. I'm not going to ask for the Lord. I don't need that for my faith. Or, as is more likely in my humble opinion, it's more like, nah. I'm not going to bother with the Lord. He could have said yes to God, and he did not. Isaiah shouts back, Ahaz, descendant of David, listen carefully. Isn't it bad enough that you wear out the patience of people? Do you have to also have to wear out the patience of my God? The Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and have a son, and she will name him Emmanuel. Wait, What? Have you heard those words before? The story goes on. He, he will be eating milk curds and honey when he learns to reject what is evil and choose what is good. You're afraid of the kings of Israel and Aram now, but before the child learns to choose good and reject evil, the lands of Israel and Aram will be empty. But that's not the part of the story that I tend to notice. 
and probably not you either. It's that sign, the virgin conceiving and giving birth to a son who's called Emmanuel. We sang about it. O come, O come, Emmanuel. That's a really old song, by the way. Over a thousand years, I think. You can check your hymnal later. Um, when you think of these, this promise about this virgin and this baby, you don't think of King Ahaz inspecting an aqueduct in Jerusalem being confronted and being asked to trust the Lord for the first time in his life. Do you? Maybe you will now. <laughs> Standing there with the prophet, the king and the courtiers was a young woman that Isaiah is pointing out. Maybe a new bride for the king, princess or concubine. She was going to have a baby, and by that time, the time that that baby could eat solid food and learn to obey mom, the kingdoms that Ahaz was afraid of would be destroyed. Unfortunately, the power that destroyed Ahaz's enemies would also lay waste to his own country because Ahaz did not say yes to God. He said, no, I'm not going to bother the Lord by trusting him and asking for a sign. I will get human help. Same characters in 2 Kings chapter 16. Ahaz sent messengers to Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, saying, I am your servant and your friend. Come and save me from the king of Aram and the king of Israel who are attacking me. Is that trusting God? <laughs> nope, asking for other help. Ahaz took the silver and gold that was in the temple of the Lord and in the treasuries of the palace, and he sent these as a gift to the king of Assyria. Dedicated treasures for God, the real God handing them over in order to hire a foreign army. Verse 9 there, The king of Assyria listened to Ahaz. He attacked Damascus and captured it, sent all its people away to Kir, and he killed Risen. Ahaz rejected what God had to offer, rejected the, the chance to trust God and let God take care of his opponents. And yes, the Assyrian army came in and beat back the problem, but created a different one. You see, armies travel, militaries travel on their stomachs. I don't know much about military, but I've been told that uh, amateurs talk about strategy where professionals talk about logistics. How do you get the food and the water and the ammunition to the troops? And the Assyrian army is paid in gold and silver to come and attack Judah's enemies, but they don't just need gold and sil silver. You can't eat those. All the produce, all the crops, the animals Judah had raised went to these foreigners. God's people were starved by their king in order to feed this foreign army. Now, if you fast forward in the narrative, you find Ahaz's son was a much better king, and when the Assyrians came to threaten this king, uh, he cried out to the Lord. Isaiah was still around, and you can find the story of Hezekiah, a good king that the Lord really did rescue from the Assyrians. Hezekiah was the kind of king to say yes to the Lord. Not perfect, but a heart towards God. And history goes on, and God's people wandered. The Babylonians came, took them into captivity. The Persians came and sent them back. The, the Greeks came through. There was a lot of chaos at that time. Eventually, the Romans, 400 years after God had last spoken through any prophet, there's this girl alone at her prayers, living in a hole in the ground. If you compare Nazareth to Mountain Home, Mountain Home looks like New York City. <laughs> We don't know how old she was. She could have been as young as 12. And this happens. Maybe you've heard this story. <clears throat> God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin. She was engaged to marry a man named Joseph from the family of David. Her name was Mary. The angel came to her and said, Greetings, the Lord has blessed you and is with you. Mary was very startled by what the angel had said and wondered what this greeting might mean. The angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. God has shown you his grace. Listen, you will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of King David, his ancestor. He will rule over the people of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will never end. Mary said to the angel, How will this happen, since I'm a virgin? 
And the angel said to Mary, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will cover you, and the baby will be holy and will be called the Son of God. And there's a sign here. Elizabeth, your relative, is also pregnant with a son, though she is too old for that. Everyone thought she could not have a baby, but she's been pregnant for six months. God can do anything. We know about this Mary. I wonder how many girls A. Gabriel visited before he found one that would say yes. Maybe she was the first one he came to. Mary said, I am the servant of the Lord. Let this happen to me as you say. And it's such a snap decision. Whether she was intimidated into it, I don't know. I bet the blood was pounding in her ears. What had just happened? What about Joseph, her fiancé? They were going to have quite a time of, uh, of it if she turned out to be pregnant before the wedding. The Bible tells us uh, Joseph was a good man. He did not want to disgrace her in public, so he planned to arrange for a secret divorce. When she told him, I wonder if she saw the disbelief in his face. She had said yes to God, and now she was going to look forward to permanent shame. No man to provide for her. Could not live at home anymore because she dis disgraced her father. Her only option would have been prostitution. And Joseph looks down into his fiancée's face as she described what happened. A virgin birth? Really? Maybe his heart was breaking too. What had she done? To blame the Lord? Isn't that blasphemous? Why would Mary say something so strange, so ridiculous? She was like, she's acting like somebody out of her mind, traumatized or something. Joseph was thinking about these things, and an angel of the Lord came to him in a dream. The angel said, Joseph, descendant of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because the baby in her really is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Was Joseph relieved, or did this create other sets of problems, or both? I bet he was relieved about Mary's character and sanity. Now he had a different set of problems, a choice to make. He had supernatural confirmation that Mary was telling the truth. He could go on with it. He could be socially shamed, lose his job, be forced to move. Didn't know that it would be as far as Egypt. Or he could keep his plans in his normal everyday life and just say, no, this is too much for me. But Joseph said yes. He said yes to God. Do you wonder if Mary and Joseph thought of this verse from Isaiah? I mean, they were in synagogue all the time, you know, regular, every week at least. And they knew the scriptures. Did they think of this, this story that we read earlier from Isaiah? King Ahaz being confronted at the aqueduct. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Do you have to try God's patience too? The virgin will conceive, and you'll call the son Emmanuel. Did Joseph and Mary feel like they were part of that story or something else entirely? Matthew was able to write with hindsight. This was a long time later. After Jesus died, come back to life, and ascended to heaven, Matthew would record it. And he said, all this happened to bring about what the Lord had said through the prophet. And then he quotes that verse that we've been circling today. It's like Matthew doesn't even know the story of Isaiah and what this reference is about, except that Jesus is the new everything for Israel, the new Israel himself, the new Moses, the new David, the new Abraham even. He was going to bring about a new exodus. Instead of leaving a nation, the people of Jesus would leave sin behind. And so all these verses that you find in the New Testament having to do with Jesus, you wouldn't be able to tell exactly what his life would be like in advance, but you can look back and see how he was fulfilling these different words. As a matter of fact, God doesn't usually tell us specific things about the future. You can come up with exceptions here and there, but when God tells us about the future, He does it in such a way that we will trust Him, even though we don't know exactly what's going to happen. A 
three people in the Bible heard these words. A virgin will conceive and the baby will be called God with us. There's a yes or no response. Ahaz said no. Or actually he said more like, eh. Mary said yes, Joseph said yes. What's God asking you to do? Or what's he going to? You might not know yet, or you might already have it banging around in your head. It might be to make a decision to follow him for the first time, or to get baptized, or to at least study it out. We've got some studies going on here. There's always room for more. Or maybe it's a specific life's work, a position in the church, or a change in how you do things at home. Mary says, let it be to me as you have said. You may not be able to get a sentence that long out of your mouth, because you might be nervous. But if you can say, yes, that will be enough. <laughs> okay. Joseph woke up. He did what the Lord's angel had told him to do. He took Mary as wife, but did not have relations with her until she gave birth to the son. And Joseph named him Jesus. The problem with saying no to God is that it might offer short-term, easier solutions. You know, hiring Assyria like Ahaz did. But ultimately it leads to nothingness, to death, to separation from God. Saying yes might be harder in the short run. But it leads to life. A fellow named Jim uh, Savigny and a, a friend were climbing in the Canadian Rockies when they were swept off a ridge by the roar of an avalanche. He woke up hours later to find that they had fallen 2,000 feet. He could see blood all over the snow. He struggled to stand up. His knees were blown out. He didn't know yet that his back was broken in two places staggered over to his climbing partner to find that that climbing partner would never wake up again. Given his injuries and their location, he decided to lie down and die. And he began to feel that sense of warmth that comes when you're freezing to death. And a voice spoke to him. It seemed to be coming from behind his right shoulder, he said later. So you can't give up. You have to live. He could say yes to the voice, start moving around, suffering, <laughs> or he could say no and go ahead with what he had already decided. But the voice began giving instructions. Get water. Put on your coat. Use the blood dripping from your nose to make an arrow in the snow so people can find you. He told an interviewer later, he says, I didn't question it. I didn't think about questioning it. I, I just did what the voice said. There's a story on CNN. The presence led him through a valley to his old campsite, and it constantly encouraged him when he felt like giving up. When he arrived at the campsite, he saw three people skiing nearby and called for help. At that moment, the presence left him. These three people that he called out to, uh, came over to where he was. One was a mountain guide, one was an elite cross-country skier, and the final person was a nurse. If you were to be in a place and you could find three people to help you, you couldn't pick three better people, he said. He says, I don't give it great thought. I'm not a spiritual person. I mean, I have a PhD in chemistry. But what Jim will say is that a mysterious presence was the only reason he got off that mountain alive. He says, there's no way I would have the strength to get up and walk across that valley and do the things I did to survive. God's grace covers everybody. And that being what it is, I don't think it's just for people who believe, although if you want to experience the kind of life Jesus offers, you do have to trust him. But you can see how, J how Jim here in the story said yes to God. He could said, say no and die, or yes, get up, struggle on his broken knees and back, and live. He did what the voice told him to do. Yes is the way to life. No is the way to death. King Ahaz said no. Eventually the country was destroyed. Joseph and Mary said yes, and 
<laughs> well, their lives were totally upended. But those sacrifices were an investment in the salvation of the world. And nobody is ever going to forget Joseph and Mary. Ever. The answers made all the difference. Isaiah shouted at Ahaz those words, A virgin shall conceive, and the child will be called God with us. He was uttering a truth maybe deeper than he knew at that moment. Heaven and earth would be changed forever by the other baby, the future baby, the baby that was born in Bethlehem. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of King David, his ancestor. He will rule over the people of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will never end. Amen. Amen.